Our Bible word is 1 Corinthians 11 verses 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So let us first have a look at the context and textual unit. Paul established the church in Corinth during his second missionary journey. He came to there from Athens and he converted also some of the Jewish people. One of them was a ruler of the synagogue there in Corinth called Sosthenes. And Sosthenes is a co-author of this letter. Also, if you go read chapter 1 verses 1. And Sosthenes was also beaten by Jews at the time when Paul established the congregation. And we can read about this in Acts 18. This is part of the second missionary journey. And of course, Paul also got into trouble with the, with the Jews. And of course, the Jews brought him in front of the Roman proconsul Gallio. Now, Gallio, he was the brother of Seneca the Younger. And Seneca the Younger he is a, was a famous Stoic philosopher. And Gallio, he was a proconsul of Corinth in the years 51 to 52. And an inscription was actually discovered that mentions Gallio. This inscription was written at the time of the Emperor Claudius. And it's dated to 52 AD. So Gallio was proconsul of Corinth. In other words, the Roman leader of the colony that or that existed and he was also the proconsul of Achaia in other words the province of Achaia and the province of Achaia is situated in what's now southern Greece and Corinth was situated in this bigger province of Achaia so Gallio the proconsul of Achaia he ruled or was in charge of Achaia roughly 51 to 52 AD and that inscription that was discovered also helped to establish this dating. Also, this is one episode in Acts where we can give a definite date or a very close date. So when Paul established the church in Corinth that we read about in Acts 18, this happened in the years 51 to 52 AD. Paul was brought before Gallio and before the judgment seat as it is called, and the judgment seat, if you go to Corinth today, you can still see it. Also in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes that we must all appear before the judgment seat or the Greek bema. The bema or the judgment seat of Christ. So Paul was brought before this judgment seat before Gallio, the Roman proconsul. But Gallio also dismissed this case. He said, well, this is a Jewish matter. I want nothing to do with it. And then it... This case was dismissed. But anyway, so this is Paul when he established the church in Corinth, roughly around the years of 51 to 52, when this Gallio incident occurred. So now when Paul wrote this letter, 1 Corinthians, he was on his third missionary journey and he was in Ephesus. So he's roughly somewhere between 53 to 55 AD when Paul wrote this letter. And, of course, the church in Corinth was facing various issues. Of course, they were, came mostly from a Gentile, or pagan background. And so, they were spiritually immature. Is issues of sexual morality had to be addressed, their behavior. And let's just briefly go through some of the issues that Paul had to discuss or deal with them. Because he heard firstly from Chloe's household. Now, Chloe, she was a woman and... Probably a house church gathered in Corinth in, in her own house. That's because most early Christians gathered in ha these house churches. In other words, mostly people from better means, from the higher, higher, higher social status. They had room in their homes for Christians to come and to gather. So Chloe was one of these people and they brought news to Paul. So people from Chloe's household. There was divisions. And we find this in chapters 1 to 4. There were divisions within Corinth. And also there's a bit of a spiritual elitism carrying on. Because these, some believed that they were perfect or mature. 
They were so impressed with themselves speaking in tongues. They thought that they were just so special and being so spiritual. And Paul had to address them also. Then from this, Paul also moves on in chapters 5 to 6, where Paul addresses issues of sexual immorality and lawsuits. Paul already previously wrote to the Corinthians. Uh, this letter we do not have. But if you go to chapter 5 verses 9, Paul actually writes there, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, etc. So Paul wrote another previous epistle to these Corinthians. Of course, unfortunately, we do not have this anymore. But yeah, Paul deals with sexual immorality and lawsuits, chapters 5 to 6. And then they also wrote a letter to him, the Christians in Corinth. If you go to chapter 7, verses 1. Paul speaks, begins to address issues that they wrote to him about. So it's about virginity and marriage in chapter 7. Then it comes to about food offered to idols. And that's in chapters 8 to 10. And then Paul addresses the Lord's Supper in chapter 11. And then also the proper use of spiritual gifts. That's in chapters 12 to 14. Then Paul also addresses the issue of the resurrection. Because there are also some of those in Corinth who denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So, Paul addresses these issues that they asked about, and they also came to, to know about, either through this news from Chloe's people, or, or this letter that was addressed to him. So, chapter 11, most of it is about the Lord's Supper. And our textual unit is chapter 11, verses 17 to 34, that is about abusing the Lord's Supper. Now, of course, banquets, that was a common practice in the ancient world. Feasts, people would come in somebody's home, also known, also known as a triclinium. It was in the form of a U shape. People would normally recline on their sides and have things to eat. So table, or that kind of eating or banqueting, that was a common practice in the ancient world. Of course, also the Jewish people, for them, they also had banquets or in feasts and also the early church based on Jesus' own practice of having meals with people that's because that's how he brought the kingdom of God to people because he shared a meal with them so that kind of practice of Jesus also based on the last supper it continued in, Christ, in the Christian tradition of them regularly coming together to have meals but yeah Paul's not happy with them and if you go read verses 17, he tells him, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. First, For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. So of course, Paul is already aware of these divisions. He already spoke about it in chapters 1 to 4. This factionalism that existed. But yeah, he also writes about it. In verse 19, For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. So he speaks here of what we may call clickiness. These cliques formed in the church in Corinth. And all those who are approved, that they may see these are the approved ones, or these are the popular ones. They, they belong to the right clique. And now Paul addresses this. They come together and he's kind of tongue-in-cheek saying, I hear there's this, this clickiness among you, you know, this, the divisions among you. And in part, I believe it, he says. So he's being a bit facetious. He's, because he knows there are these divisions that exist. And he goes on in verses 20. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, you're doing something else. Their practice is like other banquets, pagan banquets. They don't understand what the Lord's Supper means. And also what it implies in terms of their behavior amongst each other. That's why Paul's saying, you're not eating the Lord's Supper. This is something else you're doing. He carries on, verse 21, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. 
Now we must understand that in early church, what we would call today the Lord's Supper, is, was actually a proper meal. So a proper meal would, would, would be enjoyed. So if we take here yeah, from what Paul writes, people brought their food to the Christian gathering and ate it. But Paul writes here, yeah, people bring their own food and they eat it, finished, before others arrive. And there are some who get nothing. They remain hungry. And there are even some who get drunk. They drink too much wine. So this is why this is not the Lord's Supper. So he says, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? So Paul is saying, you eat nice and you have your full. And there are those who have nothing, who have nothing to eat. And you shame them. So it just reinforces the kind of social hierarchies that existed back then. So remember, part of the house, this fellowship of the Lord's Supper, would be people of higher social status, people of lower status, even slaves. Even slaves would come to the house churches and join in Christian fellowship. So now these various groups come together and they must come around and enjoy the Lord's Supper. Now Paul explains to them, what does the Lord's Supper mean? For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. So yeah, Paul reiterates, this is sacrificial. This is this bread that we break. This is the body of Jesus. This is his sacrifice. In the next word, our next verse, he says, in the same manner, he also took the cup of the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, we can also read the following verse. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So this is a covenant meal. It's a sacred meal. It's there to commemorate Jesus. This is his body. This is his blood. His body that has been given to you in death. This is blood that was shed for the new covenant. Also in the, in the previous chapter, also Paul speaks of this bread that we break. Is it not the body of Christ? And we belong to this body. In other words, we're part of the same body. It's about fellowship. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. It's about the sacrificial meaning of the bread and wine. And secondly, it's about the community of believers belonging together, being one body. And Paul says, you're not observing this. That's why he says, you, you're, not observe, you're not doing the Lord's Supper. You're doing something else here. And Paul carries on and he says, if you do not do this properly, you are guilty of the Lord's Supper. And he also says here, yeah, because you haven't do, done this properly, there is illness among you. And some have also died. And he says this is also a judgment or chastisement by God. This is also to, to avoid being condemned with the world. So because you have not observed the Lord's Supper properly, these chastisements have come upon you. Some have experienced illness or some death. So that's what Paul is actually writing here. You abuse the Lord's Supper. And he says you must come here, you must discern or you must do a self-examination when you come to the Lord's Supper. You must come there with a right understanding of yourself, also of the Lord's Supper that you will celebrate. It's not there just for fun or abuse. You must come there with a right understanding. So Paul encourages self-examination that you come to the Lord's Supper with a right frame of mind and the correct understanding. And then he speaks of this judgment that will come upon you if you do not observe the Lord's Supper properly. In verse 33 he says, Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. In other words, don't let each person do his own thing. All these little cliques that are formed. 
That's not what the Lord's Supper is about. It's not about clickiness. It's not about some displaying that they have more than others. Where some are shamed because they have nothing. They come there with no food. They remain hungry. So Paul is addressing this. Unity. Understand the Lord's Supper properly, what this means. To round off, Paul here is referring to Jesus, his attitude, what it meant, his sacrificial death. Because also in chapter 15, verses 3, he writes, this is the Jesus who, according to the scriptures, died for our sins. And also in Galatians, Paul writes, this is the Lord who loved me and gave himself for me. So this sacrificial death of Jesus, it was an act of self-love given to others, or outpouring of love. It's there to benefit others. This was the attitude which Jesus had when he instituted these special words. So that's the meaning of the sacrificial death of Jesus. And when these Corinthians come together, their attitude is the exact opposite. Some come there eating, not caring about the rest. There's this clickiness. They haves and they have nots. Those who are approved, etc. They eat their nice food. Others go hungry. Others come there and they drink and they get drunk. It's the antithesis of the death of Jesus. Because Jesus, it was an outpouring of love. That's what it, his sacrificial death means. And that's must be our attitude when we participate in the Lord's Supper. It's we commemorate the death of Jesus, his act of love, but also having fellowship with one another. We are there for the benefit of each other. We mustn't be like these Corinthians were, ce celebrating, not even celebrating it, abusing it, and coming to it with a wrong attitude, being selfish and narcissistic, etc. And also getting drunk. That's not what Jesus' death was about. So we must not abuse the Lord's Supper. We must also have his attitude. That's what it means. This fellowship of Christians, living for each other's benefit. And that's what we proclaim also when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We celebrate the Lord's death and the love that he showed for everyone.